Welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalists of Transylvania County. Welcome to the visitors to the Unitarian Universalists of Transylvania County. We're glad you're here. We appreciate you being up and awake on this rainy Sunday morning. <laughs> I mean, it was supposed to be. I guess you read it on the internet, who knows? <laughs> we live in Brevard, that's it. We're glad to have you here. This being the first of the month, I always like to remind us of our mission. Our mission is to support individual spiritual journeys and to promote social, economic, and environmental justice. And so we do. And we're glad, no matter who you are, where you've come from, who you love, how you identify yourself, we are glad you are here Please enjoy your time with us this morning. First off, I want to recognize that our uh, ministry teams are always active behind the scenes. Our Loving Hearts Helping Hands group doing the care ministry is going to feed us, not just with the care, but with yummy delights during our coffee hour, kind of a mini brunch even for us all. So. Um, much appreciation for the care and the wonder and all the love baked into uh, this offering. We appreciate it. Beltane, or Beltane, was May 1st. This is the last of the three spring festivals in the Wheel of the Year for fertility. And it occurs halfway between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. If you remember, as I do from years gone by as a kid, maypole dances, maybe that's part of the old festivals that you remember that have come through from the pagan rituals. It marks the summer season, and so here we are. I also want to mention in the announcements that this is this is the anniversary of William Ellery Channing's Baltimore sermon, Unitarian Christianity, which uh, was May 5th in 1819 and was the first time, I think, that that particular viewpoint of Unitarianism was preached with that name of that her particular heresy at the... Uh, Installation ordination service of a minister there in Baltimore. It also ends up being the anniversary, May 12th will be the anniversary of the merger or consolidation of the Unitarians and the Universalists. Why do I make a big deal of these announcements? Because we have history. And for many of you, you walk in the room and say, I never knew you existed. Oh no, we, we, we haven't existed for very long. But in reality, Unitarian Universalism has been around for a long time. I also want to remind you that today, I'm going to say this. I, I have to say this over here. I'm going to say this. You see my long, you see my long face? Did you know that the first Sunday in May is World Laughter Day? Yay! Yes. So we've already gotten a little laugh in. That's good. Uh, now on to some of our other announcements. You saw some on the screen. We had a slide up for the mountain where we have our retreat being set up. The registration process is in the works. And so we'll be giving you instructions and links to sign up for UUTC's annual retreat at the Mountain Camp and Conference Center. And, um, We, um, we also recognize that this is Mental Health Awareness Month, which has been observed in the United States since 1949. Every year during the month of May, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill joins the national movement to raise awareness about mental health, to fight stigma, provide support, educate the public, and advocate for policies that supports the millions of people in the United States affected by mental illness. And this year, the National Alliance of Mentally Ill is celebrating um, with a more than enough campaign. And I am convinced a Unitarian wrote this. 
Unitarian Universalist words are in here. Here's, the, here's their press release. It's an opportunity for all to come together and remember the inherent value we each hold. No matter our diagnosis, appearance, socio socioeconomic status, background, or ability. For every person out there to know that if all you did was wake up today, that's more than enough. No matter what, you are inherently worthy of more than enough life, love, and healing. Showing up just as you are for yourself and the people around you is more than enough. And now here in Transylvania County, TC Strong, Coalition of Schools, Community Organizations, Parents and Teens working to improve youth mental health is asking the public in May to light up green. How many of you have heard this already? Saw it in the newspaper, wearing green right now, maybe even. So the idea is during this month to show that nobody's alone facing mental health challenges and spread awareness that everyone should be cared about. TC Strong Program Director Beth Ford says, what we're working towards is a community culture where everyone feels safe talking about mental health any day, especially the hard days, and that we're better together. And so we're being asked to change out our light bulbs in our front porches. You can choose a green bulb that would be on at night. And that way, or put it a green bulb in a window where it's visible, or post messages or some other way to support mental health, or wear green, especially during the uh, upcoming week of the 14th through the 20th. So they say, light up the green is a simple way to communicate to our friends and neighbors, hey, we see you, we hear you, we're here to help you. So we hope that all will join in together on this. There is a special announcement this morning, and I'm going to invite Vicki Held to come to the pulpit and speak from the microphone. Good morning. So on behalf of the auction committee, which was myself, Donna Rayburn, Mike Griffith, Ian Cowie, and RK, we just want to announce and thank you. We raised $13,000. <laughs> and that was thanks to all of your donations. We had just such quality donations. And then you came out to our party, and you came out, and you bid against each other all week. And when we, when we first started this, because we didn't have a lot, you know, a lot of history in auctions, although this group had experience in auctions in other places, we thought, well, you know, could, maybe we could raise $4,000. And so we said, well, maybe we'll set a goal of seven. No, we'll never make $7,000. So we were flabbergasted. We were really flabbergasted. So uh, we had over 130 items, and in like in all auctions, you have a few items that get overlooked. It's nothing to do with the quality or anything. It's just uh, we have them out front this morning for the minimum bid, so this is the last time you'll see anything. And one of the most successful things we had were the home-hosted uh, dinners and experiences. Some of those are sold out. We have a few tickets left to some of those, and this will be the last day that they're offered, so stop by if you are interested in those, but once again, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you everyone. And to whoever, whoever lost to me in the bidding, I'm sorry, but I really love what I won the bid on. So. <laughs> Michael, would you open us up into worship? Yeah. Let's do that instead. <laughs> I'll uh, read from the, the cards that have already been written for the three candles we're seeing here. And then we'll ask uh, if there are more. Michael can help light. And I will uh, record on the cards here your uh, joys or sorrows as we enter into this space. I lit a candle uh, for Carla Marr, whose brother died unexpectedly uh, this past week. Um, she was to have, I, I already lit one, but you can lit, light that other one. 
Um, she was to have gone to visit him this next month. Very sad. Uh, Michael Solomon here lit a candle for all of us affected by mental health challenges, ourselves, loved ones, and friends, and the growing awareness that mental health is something everyone needs to care about. And Bruce Kirkman lit a candle of joy that UUTC will having an, be having another retreat at the mountain this September. And he says, we have many fond memories of past retreats, including last September with Reverend Bob. Are there other joys or sorrows? Victoria. Hundred and five. Oh wow! So a candle for Barry's friend's father. I mean Vic Victoria's friend Barry's father, who passed away at a hundred and five and was ready to go home. Alice. Candle for all of those who have been killed with the violence and the news this morning of yet another yesterday a mass shooting and Alice speaking in particular or being very upset. Um, there was another lockdown in the daycare for her 19-month-old grandchild. And, um, and just the horror of all of that. Now, I think I saw Barbara. I was going to say the same thing Alice said. Don't you say another. Yeah. Yeah, this is yes. Let's, let's all piggyback on yes on that. Yeah, I'm going to go to the back there. Hi, Catherine. Thank you. And Catherine was saying this is a candle of, of joy and recognition for the auction team and all that they did. Yes. Uh, yeah, go right ahead, Philip. So we're lighting a candle for Philip and Rick's friend who's traveling to Switzerland with an end of life June 7th, next month. John. Uh, candle of joy for a grandson who graduated yesterday from Brevard College, summa cum laude. Yeah. <laughs> leaving next week uh, with a friend to drive, please, to Alaska. Oh. <laughs> okay, I've been scrambling to write it all down. John Austin has lit this candle. Wonderful news. Grandson graduating here from college. Summa cum laude. And then heading off, driving off to, with a friend to Alaska. All right. Thank you all.
thank you for sharing a bit in piece of what you carry in your hearts. We know not everything has been shared, so there's time in the coffee hour. Or for folks at home, if you want to comment in the YouTube video about what's going on in your lives, this is how we weave together our fabric of community. I ask you now, with that in mind, to recognize something of the divine in one another, something of the specialness in each human being, to turn to one another, no touching, no germs, <laughs> and just recognize the wonder of each person around you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Solomon. I've been a member of this wonderful church since 2017. I'm honored to serve as your worship associate this morning. Welcome to this sacred time, this community consecrated by our presence and our commitment. I'm thrilled to see so many people here in the sanctuary today. And look at all the children joining us today. Isn't it great? And thank you to all of you online who are joining us. We begin our worship together with these words by the author Elizabeth Gilbert. The universe buries strange jewels deep within us all and then stands back to see if we can find them. The hunt to uncover those jewels that's creative living. The courage to go on the hunt in the first place. That's what separates a mundane existence from a more enchanted one. You can find this and other inspiring content in this month's Soul Matters, The Path of Creativity. Let's now worship together and explore creative living. Our musical call to worship is hymn number 330, The Arching Sky of Morning Glows. So now we more, move more deeply into our worship service with the lighting of our chalice, symbol of Unitarian Universalism.
Please join me in reading the words shared by the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Harrisonburg, Virginia. You can see it on the screen. We light this chalice as a symbol of the creativity of our liberal faith, the creativity to explore new avenues of religious insight, the creativity to develop a caring community, the creativity to envision a world of peace and freedom. And now Kevin Lausch, our Director of Children's Religious Exploration, will now speak to the children and all of us with words of wisdom. Good morning. Today we're going to be using the book called The Book of Mistakes to learn a bit about creativity and how even our smallest actions can be creative and lead to something amazing. And then I also get to see if I can remember to turn a page and flip a slide at the same time. The Book of Mistakes by Corinna Lucan. It started with one mistake. Making the other eye even bigger was another mistake. But the glasses, they were a good idea. The elbow and the extra long neck, mistakes. But the collar, ruffled with patterns of stripe and lace, that was a good idea. And the elbow patches, they were a good idea too. The bush was another good idea, dark and leafy so that you couldn't see through it. But the frog, cat, cow thing, another mistake. The space between the ground and the bottom of the girl's shoes, that was a bit of a mistake too. But the roller skates, that was definitely not a mistake. The second frog cow thing made a very nice rock. And the girl with very long leg looks like she always was meant to be climbing that tree. Even the ink smudges scattered across the sky looked as if they could be leaves, like they always wanted to be lifted up and carried. And what about the girl? Well, Don't you love how it flows and grows? How with each mistake she is becoming She's becoming something new and different. And do you see now who she could be? So just remember, when we feel we make a mistake, we don't get it right. Sometimes that's just a new pathway to something new and wonderful, exciting. Whether we're doing it with art or a paintbrush or crayons or markers, or we're doing it with our own life, it's all a pathway to something new. And now we'll call up Eli um, Seafelt, and he is going to light our children's chalice, and then we will sing the kids out.
The wonder of our world is also balanced by the parts of the world that don't go right, that are unjust, unfair. While we each may face the winds of circumstance beating at our doors, while we each may have clouds hanging over our heads, we know that there are those in society who need more than possibly we alone could give to make their lives a little less drab, a little less unfair. This month, we launched the special monthly collection for Pisco Legal Services, one of the wonderful nonprofit organizations that we support through the year and voted on as a congregation as one of the things we wanted to give to specially from the collection. When the ushers pass the baskets, anything you put into the basket comes to UUTC to help our presence be here. But anything you put into the envelopes within will go to Pisco Legal Services to do their good work in the community. We will now receive the morning offer. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Bonnie. What is given in love we receive with great joy, and we say, thank you. I invite you to center yourselves. Prepare for this moment of prayer and meditation. Spirit of love and life, we enter this space with the joys on our hearts, the beauty of a sunny day, the news of good deeds and good tidings among family, and also with our hearts feeling low, with the sorrows and the cares 
and the connections we hold that are now in a sadder place. In particular, this morning, we pray for all of those who may be diagnosed or undiagnosed with mental health challenges, ourselves, our loved ones, and our friends. Our hearts go out to those who are facing losses, Carla Marr, the loss of her brother, Philip and Rick, knowing their friend's trip to Switzerland means an end. To the losses of those who are suffering in the daily, weekly, moment by moment mass shootings in this country. And those affected in the ripple effects of shutdowns and fear and wondering what will happen. Our hearts go out to Victoria's friend whose father has passed away at 105. Our hearts also go out to those who are celebrating, those launching transitioning in this season of graduations for John Austin's grandson. Those who are celebrating the success of their efforts to work so hard for this congregation and for all who have brought joy through the auction here. We hold these joys and sorrows, these fears and hopes in the silence, in our minds and our hearts. names of all those known and unknown, remembered and forgotten, in the names of all the helpers of humankind, we say, Amen, blessed be. Building up 
up a world, oh, I'm gonna let it shine, oh, building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine, building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it Now I know you wish you could have sung along with that, so here's your chance. Everybody, this little light of mine. Thank you. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. I, I have no clue how I'm going to tie that in to a sermon on creativity. It's, it's, it's just so obtuse in its message. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it when John and the musicians and everyone has a chance to bring forward something that just lends so much to our worship life and the messages I bring. I did want to say uh, next week we'll get to recognize John and Carlene in particular for all that they've been volunteering and doing for our music program. We've had candles lit one at a time from now and then, but we need something in a service. So instead of words of wisdom, we'll have a little chance to say thank you. I am grateful. Now, the reading that I have this morning was uh, picked out uh, by Michael. Uh, I like it. It's from Julia Cameron from The Artist's Way, A Spiritual Path to Higher Creativity. Some of you are nodding. You know that book, The, the uh, Artist's Way. And I know, I don't know about in this congregation, but maybe 15 years ago or so, I, I know of a congregation that, and other congregations that were using it as a basis for a weekly or monthly uh, artistic discussion group. I don't that's a contradiction in terms. Artistic exploration group and to go deeper into understanding, tapping into creativity and meaning and special um, connections with pieces that may have been left untouched for years since they were children. Let's hear the words. People frequently believe the creative life is grounded in fantasy. The more difficult truth is that creativity is grounded in reality, in particular the focused, the well-observed, or specifically imagined. As we lose our vagueness about ourself, our values, our life situation, we become available to the moment. It's there in the particular that we contact the creative self. Until we experience the freedom of solitude, we cannot connect authenticity. We may be enmeshed, but we are not encountered. Art lies in the moment of encounter. We meet our truth and we meet ourselves. We meet ourselves and we meet our self-expression. We become original because we become something specific, an origin from which work flows. Hmm. This morning's sermon fits our monthly theme packet, Soul Matters theme packets. The 50 or so of you who have signed up for those know that each month you have something to do at home to go deeper into it. Um, and uh, the, the path of creativity, the, this, this whole month gives us some richness uh, to touch something that may have been forgotten but is so essential. I, I wrote in my blurb that um, 
it said that the word creativity wasn't in use until after Darwin's theories were published. And mostly during the current generations, you, you all's lifetimes. And um, how I believe this matters in theology. I mean, I've done a whole sermon on Darwin once upon a time. I, I think it must have been an anniversary of some sort in his life or, or the work, his work he had done on the Beagle of going to Galapagos and Island and writing up his theories. And there's so much about the story about how uh, it couldn't be released right away. Things just couldn't be understood that society was going to be overly reactive. There were certain religions, Unitarianism and Universalism, which seemed to be uh, holding at least a few more people than in general who were able to embrace some new thing. But as a uh, colleague of mine had written out, the, the ways in which we have gone through our ever-expanding concepts of the world that we have decentered, decentered certain things in, in our theologies. We've decentered the earth from the center of our universe. We've decentered human beings. We've decentered even a creator God. That was, I guess, some of the fear of religionists. Oh no, here's a challenge to everything we hold dear, the way we understand things. I, I had readings even, even in this past decade or so about how people are saying, no, no, there is, there is no evolution because evolution can't explain how the complexity of an eye is created. And I'm thinking, as I read each one of these, it's like, to me, people grasping at things they don't understand to prove that their faith is strong. And I feel bad for the moment that scientists prove how evolution led to an eye. They will have to find something else to say, well, if it's, if it's not that that has no explanation in evolution, I'm sure there's something else because we can't believe in it. Somebody once said that they didn't want to be told that they were related to a monkey. Now, um, and yet when we look at our, at our DNA, what we're made up of. This is from a Unitarian Universalist website that Michael had told me about, something that the uh, Church of the Larger Fellowship, kind of our mail order church uh, congregation, has out there. There was a topic on embodiment, and they said this in, in that. Bless you. You share 55% of your DNA in your genes with a banana tree, 80% with a cow, 98.5% with a chimpanzee, and 99.99% with every other human being on the planet. One ten thousandth of the DNA in our genes is responsible for all the differences we see in humanity. For the hundreds of rainbow shades that skin, eyes, and hair come in, for the differences that make it so hard to find organs to transplant. For every shape and size that human, come, human beings come in, notice your connection to other living beings and feel your relation to them. They are your kin. Remember I was saying that sometimes the new ideas that come along decenter us. We're no longer the center of the universe. We're no longer the center of everything. This is amazing for theology. There's a theology out there, and I've mentioned in passing, and I'll mention in passing now, process theology. Hartshorn, uh, who lived from, what, what, 1897 to 2000, 
uh, had the major ceremonies of his life in Unitarian churches, but I don't know that he was claiming to be a Unitarian Universalist. And he was a proponent of a certain strand of process theology. And what that does is says that basically God is always in process. Everything that's created adds to God. Every time you have painted a picture, drawn glasses around a big blob on the page and call it a thing, every time that you are able to scientifically be able to get us to think in new ways or produce a play, sing a song or write a new one, every time that you're being creative, you are evidence and participating in changing God. There's so much more I could go into with that, but in this theme of creativity, this means an awful lot. And, and this book that I have here reminds me of a General Assembly workshop I had with Robert Fulgham, the author of All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten our Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. I mean, he put his newsletter columns into a book and it became a national bestseller. One of the things that he said was, and think of it yourselves, when you're kin in kindergarten and the teacher says, how many of you can paint a picture? How many of you can sing? dance? How many of you can make up a story? But by the time they get to high school, it's like, mm, okay, the kids in the glee club will say, yeah. <laughs> kids in theater, maybe, yeah. Maybe one or two others. By the time you're an adult, I'm not telling anybody I can sing. I just sing in the shower. There's something about the way we're socialized that takes us away from that wondrous, creative, spark, peace. And that's not right. We need the questions to draw us out. We need the actions in our lives that bring back that springboard into things. Sometimes it's being around other creative people that does it. Sometimes, did you see the picture of the, uh, the people on the rock at the mountain looking out over the rest of the mountains? The two kids looking out over the mountain. Look at that. How many people could spend time there without thinking a creative thought? I mean, what, what are you going to do? Go over your laundry list when you're sitting there? There are places and ways in our lives that we come to creativity. Now, it's not always easy. Sometimes we need a space where we sit and we say, today I will write one sentence. Today I will whatever it is that stretches us into the creative spot that we used to have. When we bring ourselves to remember what it means to make something new in life, then we are imbibing in that energy. Because what we've learned over time decenters us, I believe that one of the best places for me is out on walks, to go for my walks and my meditation. I, I can walk going forwards. I found that meditating Buddhist practice was best done this way, with my eyes closed in a hallway where I wasn't going to trip over a rock. Outside, I'd rather go forward and keep my eyes open. 
something about the breezes and the sunshine, the smell of the new ferns coming up, whatever it may be that helps me get back into that space within, takes away some of society's laden burdens, sweeps away the news, if only for a moment, gives me a sense of being. Somebody asked me the other day, well, Bob, are you, do you work every day? When's your day off? And I, I've been telling people I don't have a day off. Part of it is through COVID, I could never understand what day I should take off. While I'm in lockdown at home, I mean, what is that? I don't know. And part of it is because I take two nights a week off to go sing. I sing with two choruses up in Asheville. We create music. Now, we didn't write the music, but we're interpreting it. We're bringing in joy to people. What do you do one week to another that has that kind of discipline? These are the questions. These are the wonders. These are the things that stretch and refresh who we are. I had a whole bunch of really deep, intense research for this sermon, which for some reason doesn't show up on this screen, must be on my laptop only. You'd think I could make the two communicate with each other. But I'm kind of glad that I walked up here without all of that stuff because, because I don't think it would have made any of you feel more able to sing or dance or write or do. I think what it did was help me center to be able to say to you, this is our place. This is our safety. This is our encouragement. This is our religion in which we might have some hints of being part of something greater than ourselves and to be reminded of our true selves. If we were created in the image of the divine and the divine was creativity itself, that we might remember that and be that for one another for the children in our lives, for the elders in our lives, from our neighbors. And also for the blessed banana tree, our cousin, or the cow. Somebody said, even the cucumber we're related to. Has this opened the subject? Yes. Has this closed the subject? No, it's just the beginning of the month of creativity. But I invite you to listen to the words of our hymns, to think of the wonder and beauty of what you bring into the world, and to remember again what Robert Fulgham reminded us, that society may begin to teach us we can't sing, we can't write, we can't paint, but remember instead the story that Kevin had. And maybe the next time we doodle, we will make of our mistakes something broader and newer and find ourselves in a landscape that we didn't see before. Maybe so. Our closing hymn is number 319, and if you have a hymn book in front of you, you're going to be confused because we're singing it to tune 277. So there. <laughs> and that's on purpose. One of the things I learned in, in uh, hymnody is if you, can't think, if you don't think you can teach a congregation a new hymn tune, use an old one. And they all have little codes in the bottom of how you can trade them around. And this one's common meter. So we're going to use a different common meter that you probably have heard enough times that you can sing the words. 
The words will be on the screen, ye earthborn children of a star. As I extinguish the chalice, I leave with you, actually, am I going to extinguish it? Where's my snuffer? I'm going to be creative. <laughs> I'm going to leave you with some questions to ponder. I hope it makes you uncomfortable. I hope it feels like something you have to deal with. These are from Rebecca King, the Dean of Chaplains at United Church Homes in, uh, in Ohio. Um, what are your avenues of creativity? How does being creative bring a sense of abundant life and spiritual fulfillment? How might the church practice the spiritual practice of creativity during this season? How might engaging in spiritual practices strengthen intergenerational bonds within a congregation? And now, may you find the spirit in your creative pursuits today, tomorrow, and beyond. Mm -hmm.